Hello, welcome to the first of four tutorial videos for How to Unhurry, the companion to my book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, How to Stay Emotionally Healthy and Spiritually Alive in the Chaos of the Modern World. If you've read my book, you know the first half is essentially my case for slow over against a culture of speed. I have come to the firm conviction that hurry is incompatible with the love, joy, and peace that are right at the center of Jesus' vision of life in the kingdom of God. I don't think I can live in the kingdom of God with Jesus and live a life of speed. But then the second half of the book is four practices for unhurrying your life. Silence and solitude, Sabbath, simplicity, and slowing. And how to unhurry, and with this video tutorial, I just take you through kind of step-by-step step some exercises to move into each practice, to move from the idea of silence and solitude, the theory of it, to the practice itself, to get it from your mind into your muscle memory, into your body, into your day-to-day -day life. To start things off, silence and solitude. Many people would call this practice the most important and the most radical and the most countercultural of all the practices in the way of Jesus. In silence and solitude, we come to quiet with God and with our own soul. You know, if you read the four Gospels, one of the first things you notice about Jesus is that he would oscillate back and forth between time in community and then time in the quiet place or in silence and solitude. He would live in this rich web of dense relationships, but then on a regular basis he would sneak away to just come to quiet, rest, sleep, climb to the top of a mountain, get out in nature and pray before his Father and come to quiet in his own soul. And if we are to live in what Jesus called the easy yoke, just this joyful, restful, loving cadence and companionship with Jesus himself, then we need to copy this same movement back and forth between community, but also silence and solitude. Now, to get you started in your practice, just a few things before we begin. First, you need to set a time and a place. A time, just whatever works best for you. For most people, it's first thing in the morning upon waking. But maybe it works better for you while the little kids are napping in the middle of the day or on your lunch break or after work on the way home before dinner or before bed. Just whatever works best for your personality, your stage of life, all of that. Then, a place. Find somewhere as quiet and distraction-free as possible. A quiet chair by a window, a park down the street from your house if it's a nice time of year, your living room, whatever works for you. Just get somewhere quiet where you can come to rest before God. Then next, you need to just set a modest goal. Like, don't overreach. Don't start with, you know, two hours of prayer every morning or whatever. Just start very simple. For most people, 10 or 15 minutes two or three times a week. If you're already doing that, up it to every day. If you're already doing that, consider maybe you up it to an hour a day or 30 minutes a day, or you just give your time more focus and intentionality. And finally, if you're an S on the Myers-Briggs, if you're familiar with that framework, meaning if you're more of a doer than a thinker, you're more about the practical and the day-to-day -day than kind of the theory or the conceptual, you might want to consider just doing something with your hands or your body um, if it's hard for you to sit still. Maybe that is folding laundry or doing the dishes or I often like to go on a walk, whatever works for you. Just something that's not a distraction, but rather to let your mind focus and come to rest in your heart. Then before you get started, just a few words of encouragement. One, start where you are at, not where you should be. One of my favorite things about Jesus is he's so gracious just to meet us where we are, our level of maturity, our level of awareness and connection to the Spirit of God, our grasp of reality. He's just so kind to meet us right where we're at and to just with grace move us forward. So just meet God where you are at. Secondly, remember that you can't succeed or fail at this practice. Like, if you're a perfectionist or have that inner perfectionist, I feel you just release that side of you. Just let it go. Resist the urge to say, I'm good at this or I'm bad at this or that went well or that went lousy or I didn't like it or I'm not good at it or this isn't for me. Just let all of that go in one ear and out the other. And we define success just by we show up. We're just present to the best of our ability before God. And even when your mind wanders, don't even worry about it. The point is just to be present before God.
Now, I think we're ready. There are four exercises that I have for you. The first is breathing prayer. This is an ancient form of contemplative prayer. We hear a lot in our culture right now about mindfulness from a secular perspective or meditation from a Buddhist perspective. And many followers of Jesus, in particular in the Protestant tradition, don't realize we have this rich, ancient heritage of contemplative prayer where people use the breath, followers of Jesus use the breath as a way just to come to presence in the moment. You just begin, you just settle in, you get to your quiet place, place, your time, you take some deep breaths and you begin to just notice your breathing and use that even as a form of prayer. It's just coming to presence in the moment, present to God, present to your body, present to your mind, and deeper than that to your soul. The ancients would call this praying without words, where you just sit. I think of St. John of the Cross, who said the language that God hears best is silent love. You just sit there in silent love with your attention and your affection directed at God as his affection and attention is directed at you. And you just begin to use this at the beginning of your day or the end of your day or all through your day to slow down and come to rest in God. The next exercise is feeling and listening prayer. You know, we all have emotions, and not all of them are pleasant or positive. And often, in particular in our culture, what we do with the unpleasant emotions is we just stuff them or deny them or distract ourselves or ignore them or self-medicate. But emotions are actually a core part of our soul, and for many of us, they are where we meet with God. This is with one of the main lessons of the Psalms in the middle of the Library of Scripture. And so in this exercise, you basically come to quiet and you let yourself feel. You just let whatever emotions are under the surface of your busy life come to the top and you just notice them. You just see what you see. You watch what you watch. This is called mind sight, right, in a secular kind of frame where you just think about what you think about and you notice whatever comes to the surface and you just name it without judgment. Oh, that's envy. That's insecurity. That's fear. That's bitterness. Whatever it is, positive or negative, you let it come to the surface And then you use it as a meeting place with God. And either just release it, let it go. I think of my Ignatian friends that write about indifference, where, not indifference in the negative sense, but where you let go of the need for life to be the way you want it in order to live at peace and at joy and at love. And you just let whatever comes, come. And you be grateful for all. Or you go the opposite direction and you partner right with kind of King David in the Psalms or I think of Moses or Abraham or Jacob and you wrestle with God. You argue with God. You pray. You petition. You lay out your case for why you got, want God to do something or change your life or your emotions. Both have an ancient, strong, biblical precedent for you to lead into. Third exercise is Lectio Divina. Don't worry if you're not familiar with that language. It's Latin language. It's ancient. It just means sacred reading. And it's a way of reading the library of Scripture. There's more than one way to read the Bible. There's reading large chunks of the Bible at once, kind of read through the Bible in a year. There's Bible study where you pay attention to the text and the Greek or the Hebrew or the history of the theology. There's teaching where you sit under a teacher. And then there's Lectio Divina, which is one of my favorites, where you read the Bible slowly a very small section, and you read it more than once, two, three, four times, and you meditate on it in the language of Psalm 1. If you've ever read Psalm 1, it's Lectio Divina in a psalm. And you just notice for any word or phrase or idea that comes kind of to the surface of the text, and just some would say it shimmers, meaning something in your heart is just drawn. There's there's an attention in you that, ah, I notice that. When I do this with my kids around the dinner table, I'll just say, what did you notice? And each person will share, oh, that line or that idea or that was really interesting. Just some kind of connection with your heart and you let God speak to you through the text and by the Spirit. The last exercise is just a retreat where you do any of this stuff or whatever is on your heart, but just for an extended period of time. There's only so much you can do in 10 or 15 minutes before you rush out the door to your day. And many teachers of the way of Jesus, and I would put myself in this as well, would really encourage you on a regular basis, say once a quarter or at least once or twice a year, to just take a day or even just a half day to get away on retreat, pray, journal, rest, nap, lay your life before God, listen to the voice of God in your life and set it all before him. Now, I think that's enough to get you started. If you don't have it already, go to my website, download How to Unhurry to begin your practice of silence and solitude.